order uh, within 30 seconds of starting our monthly webinar. I would like to thank everyone that uh, signed on today. We will be recording this uh, webinar, so uh, please feel free to pass this on uh, to others as we uh, develop that uh, YouTube. And again, our April 1st webinar uh, for the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC. I would ask that uh, during the presentation, if you would mute your phone so we have a, a good clear uh, uh, audio, and we'll hold all our questions until the end of the PowerPoint. Today's webinar will focus on uh, many partner-related monarch butterfly and pollinator conservation efforts within the Gulf Coast Prairie region of Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. Since the Presidential Memorandum of June 20th, 2014, uh, which created a federal strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators, the conservation community has rallied with many federal, state, agency, and organization efforts for planning and getting work done on the ground to support these uh, pollinators and especially the monarch. As a landscape cooperative, the Gulf Coast Prairie recognizes this strong connection between monarchs and other important grassland dependent conservation efforts. Our Gulf Coast Prairie focus has been to promote functional grassland landscapes with high profile species like the monarch. Our message, this message for functional landscapes is reaching a much greater audience than ever before. Uh, our speaker today is Julie McIntyre. Julie is the Southwest Regional Pollinator Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Many of you may have met her at our January Steering Committee meeting. I will say Julie has worked tirelessly over the last six to eight months building partnerships and seeking efficiencies in this time of high-profile monarch and pollinator conservation initiatives. Also on the webinar today, you'll hear some specific agency and organizational items from several of our steering committee and science team members like Rob Zier with the NRCS, uh, Don Wilhelm, Matt Wagner, and also Wendy Caldwell from the Monarch Joint Venture. His, it will be with us today. So with that, Julie, I will turn it over to you and we will go to mute here in the Central Clearinghouse. Thank you so much, Bill. Can you all hear me? Sound great, Julie. Okay, yeah. fabulous. Just checking in. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here and have this opportunity. So without further ado, um, I'm going to begin with an update on our 90-day finding. And we were petitioned, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned in August of 2014 to uh, consider listing the monarch as federally threatened. We had um, a response out at the end of December, which began a 60-day comment period. That closed on March 2nd, and the Midwest region, Region 3, is the lead region for the Fish and Wildlife Service in terms of responding and working on the 12-month finding. Uh, so the 12-month finding at this point is, will most likely begin um, at the end of 2016, even perhaps into early 2017, and the completion date of that is unknown at this time. So at the national level, there are several goals that are um, being discussed, and we are awaiting a final federal monarch strategy which is due, hopefully, this September. In the meantime, we're aiming for a goal of 300 million monarchs by the year 2020. And this will, of course, involve the engagement of an array of partners at all levels, internationally, federally, at the state, tribal, county, city, and even citizen level. We are hoping through this to involve a new generation in conservation and also uh, support a full range of other pollinators 
uh, that could benefit by actions um, done, by mon done for monarch conservation. So just briefly, <laughs> thus far, um, federal agencies have really stepped up their focus on monarchs. And the high-level working group that was formed um, at the national level is a combination of many individuals, monarch experts, and other uh, state um, directors and um, federal entities. And they're continuing to coordinate the monarch outreach and strategy. And they're the ones that will be um, creating the strategy itself and, and hopefully um, publishing that, as I mentioned. The um, NRCS has done a lot of work already in, in, uh, over the years, and they are focusing on private lands and within that on milkweed plantings in the central U.S. That, that cover the heart of the monarch migration. And Rob, would you like to um, elaborate on that? Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, over the years, I guess, you know, starting back with um, PRP and once uh, the pollinator decline uh, became prevalent, you know, we were tasked with helping in developing technical uh, recommendations for uh, planting pollinator habitat. And so, you know, that started oh, about four or five years ago where we had uh, looked into plants and, you know, the times that they flower and where they're adapted in certain areas in the state. and um, provided that assistance to um, the Farm Services Agency as well as to our clients out in the field. And, you know, through that we have a little over uh, 12,000 acres of CRP that's been planted into uh, pollinator habitat. Uh, then in addition to that, our plant material centers, which there are 27 in the nation and we have three in Texas, uh, have been working towards, uh, you know, developing recommendations of uh, when to plant certain plants and where and, and providing information relative to what their flowering time is. In addition to um, our plant material center down in Kingsville in cooperation with uh, the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute, uh, South Texas natives uh, working and we'll be evaluating uh, various um, milkweed species, uh, evaluating the propagation techniques and um, you know, the flowering aspects and establishment of those. So those are just a few items that we've, we've been working on here recently. Thanks, Rob. So just again, briefly, the USGS is continuing to work on their demographic model out of the Powell Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. And that will be uh, help to target restoration areas. And we're hoping for a tool um, for agencies and others to use um, actually this month, <laughs> right now in April. Um, the Forest Service posted a monarch strategic framework on their website. It's a lovely document um, on March 18th. And they're also working on a population assessment, working on seed mixes, improving pollinator habitat within their ongoing projects. And they're looking to conserve uh, about 250,000 acres of habitat in 2015 and 2016 for monarchs and pollinators um, that, that is already existing, but really focusing on um, making sure that that's intact. The National Park Service um, just completed an inventory of what they can provide, and they estimate to be involved in about 20 monarch projects in, in 2015. And uh, they're looking at integrating into pollinator corridors um, to provide, you know, a network for, for um, pollinators and monarchs for movement and in, um, access to their resources. And they are also following the Fish and Wildlife Service lead in phasing out neonicotinoids by 2016. Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, I'm not sure if anyone um, is on from uh, that, the agency, but I'm briefly just covering what I know of what they're doing. Um, they have a draft plan for monarchs. I think they're working on finalizing that. Um, they also have a monarch working group, and they're working in conjunction with the Texas Comptroller and some federal agencies on that. They have hosted some state pollinator powwows, which are gatherings of um, experts uh, to large audiences interested in pollinators and sharing that information. They have um, 
uh, created a document that is the identification of milkweeds of Texas. It's in draft form. And that is to help folks identify milkweeds and provide information to their iNaturalist program, which is an app that allows the public to identify um, different species of Texas. They're all, they also have a beautiful Monarch website, and they're working on research questions with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Texas Comptrollers. Um, just, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a four-pronged approach for Monarch uh, conservation, and the first one is outreach and education, the second one is habitat, the third one is seed development, and then the fourth one is um, research and monitoring. And this is for the Southwest region. We're forging ahead because we're still waiting on the federal strategy, so we, we've developed our own um, regional strategy that we will roll into the federal strategy once it comes out. So we received funding from headquarters to create the Texas and Oklahoma Pollinator and Monarch Partnership, which is a gathering of as many people who are interested in uh, uh, joining together, and we hope to put on some webinars and additional meetings in the future. We've had a few preliminary ones, and this will mainly focus on outreach and education, and this is believed to be the lowest hanging fruit in terms of attaining the most conservation possible. Uh, you know, to inform uh, uh, the human community. Um, so the focus will be schools, other communities, um, uh, sharing gardening information, reaching out to uh, rural landowners because, as we know, over 95% of, of the land is owned privately in Texas and Oklahoma. Excitingly, we're also working with some tribes in Oklahoma that are interested in growing milkweed and wildflowers. And our focus is going to be on the 250-mile swath uh, that parallels the I-35 corridor, because that is, again, the heart of where the monarchs are migrating. We have so many partners that I couldn't fit them all onto this slide, but we're grateful for these active partners at this time, and we're, all, we're looking to include whoever wants to be involved. Um, one of these is particularly important, the Monarch Joint Venture, and Wendy Caldwell, um, who is helping to run this great organization is on the phone right now. And Wendy, would you like to speak a little bit about the Monarch Joint Venture? Sure. I can talk just very briefly. Um, this segues nicely into sort of a more national effort. So the Monarch Joint Venture is a national partnership, and we established in 2009. And the partners that you see listed here, there are 26 in total, and hey, in, in ranging from federal agencies to nature centers. Sorry, it, was there a problem? No, Wendy, it's not. Uh, I, I, I figured when you weren't in the office that you were probably. OK, I could hear somebody talking in the background. If, uh, um, if, if, any, if anybody else is on the phone that's not speaking, if they put their phone on mute, okay. that would be great. OK, are you, are you available on Monday? <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. Wendy, do you want to go ahead? When you get back to the office, if you'll just um, shoot me an email with some dates when you are available, and then I'll go back to the secretary. Uh, if Apparently, there's someone on the phone okay. carrying on a conversation. If you'd please put your phone on mute. Right. right. Bill, are you the leader for the call? Go ahead and in the first small yes, garden. Yes, I am the leader. So one thing you can do is you can do star four, and that will mute everybody else except for you. This year, and then I think if you do that, the speakers will then need to do star four in order to end, or start the uh, Which I think is probably still within your fiscal year. So if you do star four, it'll mute everybody, and then the speakers need to do star six to unmute themselves, and then we'll be able to hear them. Okay, Wendy, is that you that's speaking? No. Right. Okay. I I think we may have solved our problem. Go ahead, Wendy. I'm sorry for the interruption. Okay. Can you hear me okay. now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I will just carry on here. Um, so, to reiterate, the Monetary Venture is a national partnership, um, ranging in in levels of partnership from federal agencies down to nature centers and. What I am doing as the coordinator of this program is working with all of these different agencies to 
coordinate and collaborate on monarch conservation in the U.S. So we have three main focus areas, um, similar to what Julie just mentioned about habitat, um, education, outreach, and, and research and monitoring. And so we work with all of our partners in different capacities to implement monarch conservation, education, research, and monitoring throughout the country. Um, and the last thing I would point out is that there's, um, as opposed to the, the national strategy that we're still waiting on, um, we're guided by the North American Monarch Conservation Plan, which is a document available on our website that was developed in 2008. And so the joint venture has worked to um, from this document to update our implementation plan each year. So um, we bring really broad knowledge base to monarch conservation, bringing in researchers and conservationists who have been working in monarch conservation for you know, 20, 30, 50 years, and um, utilizing their expertise to build a, a strong implementation plan. So if you haven't already, I invite you to go to our website and, and see some of the materials that we have available. Thanks. Thank you so much, Wendy. Yeah, Monarch Joint Venture is a great place to start in, um, you know, enhancing your Monarch knowledge and understanding. And we're lucky to have them to piggyback upon <laughs> in this endeavor. Um, so our second um, prong is uh, habitat, as mentioned. And our goals are just to conserve what's already there to the greatest degree we can and, you know, restore habitat that needs it and manage properly to maintain habitat that just needs a little tweak or, or needs to be maintained at a good level. Um, and we're focusing on the spring breeding habitat, which would be milkweed for the monarchs to lay their eggs on and the larvae to consume, and also uh, uh, native wildflowers because the adults need nectar to continue on their migration north. And we're also focusing on the fall migration habitat, which would be primarily nectar sources because the literature has indicated that Texas in particular is an area where monarchs need nectar sources that they convert into lipids and fat storage to endure their winter um, phases in Mexico. So just briefly, we're, we're working on, in, in, in this year, um, 2015, the Fish and Wildlife Service is working with partners to restore or enhance, mostly enhance, about 8,000 acres of private lands. Most of that is through the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program. And then it, um, habitat conservation plans and conservation banks have already conserved or are, are in the process of conserving by the end of FY15 another 54,000 acres. And most, many of that has overlap with other species that are listed. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service lands on our National Wildlife Refuges, we're looking at about 3,000 acres. And then we have some tribal land uh, that is actual restoration. A lot of that is in New Mexico and some in Oklahoma. Urban projects, we have gardens going on in, in four, big area, four big cities, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, and actually San Marcos and perhaps San Antonio. Um, we're looking to follow many of the EPIC project concepts, which include green infrastructure and management and, and, and also a diversity of human partners. Um, and we're also looking to strategically place these so that we create stepping stones for poll pollinator habitat. We're also involved in rural land management, and this is much more extensive than this list, but I wanted to highlight that we were able to fund out of our money from headquarters um, a GRIP project that, that enhances seed mixes to plant on private lands. And also we have uh, beefed up our funding for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife um, agreements with private landowners. Seed development, this was recognized um, as a need because there is um, a paucity of milkweed seed in Texas and Oklahoma. So we're looking to provide that to uh, people that are interested in planting milkweed seeds. One of our fo foci is maintaining regional milkweed diversity because the southwest region has the highest diversity of milkweed plants of any um, areas in the U.S. and Texas has the highest at 37 different milkweed species. So basically we're looking to harvest the native milkweed seeds within their ecoregions, 
and grow these, produce seeds and plants, and then distribute these to other partners and even the nursery industry. Uh, we were able to fund five projects from our headquarters money, um, and these just briefly were, are with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, NRCS with their plant material centers um, out of Kingsville, and even uh, some involved Texas Parks and Wildlife Department um, and universities. And we also are doing another plant material center study. We funded one in Oklahoma. And then uh, we're, we're actually helping tribes to grow milkweed and other wildflowers. So our research is focused on you know, what is the best management. These seem to be the recurring themes. Um, how does milkweed respond? And what are the best flower mixtures and plantings in terms of species and timing, much of what Rob uh, had mentioned? Um, and we're always open to collaboration on this, um, but, but a recent call with the Texas Comptroller and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, um, these three questions emerged after that call, and it's, it's again, milkweed response to different management methods, and there, are, um, there is plant survey data from the last 20 to 30 years, so that's going to be used. This, this is an idea, but it, it it might be funded by the Texas Comptroller's Office, we're not sure yet, but it, um, they would look into using this data and then looking at management methods over the past um, decades and, and look to see how milkweed and other native plant species responded. Another one is best management practices and ideal seed planting. So those are some questions we're looking into. Monitoring is, is basically um, a lot of what's been going on, as Wendy mentioned, for, for decades. We're looking at egg, larval, and adult um, phases of the monarch. We're also trying to help people create and understand monarch way stations. And we're interested in engaging citizen science in, in uh, tagging monarchs and seed collecting. We also were funded for two SCA positions, and they created a new program. Um, Sally Jewell, the Secretary of the Interior, had created the 21st Century Conservation Corps for Youth. Um, and they're basically, you can take any different model, but we've chosen to take the, the Student Conservation Association model. But she added um, four monarchs. So this is a unique program just started out of headquarters. Hopefully it'll last a, a, a little while. But we're going to be funding two positions in Texas, one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and the other in the Austin area. And both will be housed on our national wildlife refuges, but work um, mainly in, ur in urban, in the big urban cities nearby. And they will mainly be doing education and outreach. Um, we're also interested in, in um, the monarch, messaging the monarch as a species that has many benefits for other species. So we're looking to create mutual benefits. And these can cover both listed species and other species of concern that are uh, living on private lands. And, and if private landowners are interested in their conservation, this can be a way to you know, um, attain mutual benefits. So this map is a little bit busy, but as you can see, um, throughout the monarch spring breeding area, there are uh, a, a number of listed species and unlisted species of, um, uh, of conservation concern. And the LCC focal species are also covered in this. Um, the black-capped vireo, golden-cheeked warbler, northern bobwhite quail, and the eastern meadowlark. Um, these come from Joe and his fabulous work, and just, they just really show how these species do overlap, these bird species. So if we look at the monarch butterfly, it goes from the, you know, barely into the short grass, mainly the, the native warm season grasses, into the tall grass and, and shrubs. And these other grassland birds have similar habitats. And this is just, I, I like how this <laughs> illustrates the, um, the habitat use overlap. So they do have similar habitat needs, and this is something where monarch conservation can be an umbrella species as well for these other species. Um, this is also some of Joe's research, and it's a little busy, but it basically, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's Jim. I always get those names mixed up. I, I meant Jim. Um, um, grassland birds and monarchs overlap temporally and spatially, and um, you can see that uh, yeah. where we have the monarch butterfly on the top of these graphs, um, temporally there is some overlap, but there's a lot of spatial overlap in terms of their habitat needs. Right. Have you done that already? Or? Yeah. 
Um, we have ongoing research, just this is a busy slide, but mainly tagging events going on on refuges and state lands. We're collecting milkweed seed. We're creating new classrooms. I think 23 are slated in our region for this year. Um, we're implementing best management practices already on national wildlife refuges where we're alternating the burns and reducing mowing and again phasing out neonicotinoids. Um, and we're providing updated information on our website and we're, pr we're creating classroom materials and other brochures and pamphlets and flyers. Um, we're also coordinating urban gardens and including milkweeds in ongoing projects and going back and revisiting some gardens and planting milkweeds in those. So um, in terms of our research needs, um, again, we discussed some of this already, but we're looking for best management practices that benefit as many species as possible, how to understand milkweed growth, ideal plantings, and um, citizen scientists to help identify and harvest the seeds, and continue monitoring larvae on uh, all different lands. Um, and we're looking for collaboration. So upcoming uh, Let's, uh, events and activities. We have the trilateral meeting coming up the week of April 13th through the 17th, and that is a meeting with Canada and Mexico. This year it's in San Diego, and Monarchs will be um, a, a huge theme during that week. Um, we are offering a Monarch Coordinator Detail position, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, located in Austin, that will help with our top mop and help coordinate that and run that. Um, and that would start sometime in May or June of this year and run for a year. We're also working with the National Wildlife Federation and NIFWIF. We're looking to um, explore future uh, proposal opportunities with them. Also, we're involved in the um, multi-LCC EPIC project that uh, you all probably know about. Um, and also the um, NRCS Monarch Strategy, we're hoping to engage with, with them and, and help spread their excellent information. And we're also, um, the Corps of Engineers is, uh, has recently expressed interest and they are developing an informal strategy for pollinators and, and we're looking forward to helping out with that. So that's the end. <laughs> Do you all have any questions? Thank you, Julie. I I, uh, I was curious if uh, if there was anyone on the phone that wanted to add to uh, some of the the efforts that are ongoing. Uh, we're checking the chat as well to see if uh, uh, we have a okay, and uh, and we'll we'll uh, uh, take any questions now from anyone if you have them for Julie. Wendy, was there anything in addition that you might want to add uh, relative to uh, future activities or efforts that you're aware of? Um, not that I can think of. Um, I guess the one thing maybe we didn't cover was the, the Keystone Initiative, more focused on agricultural areas and, and getting habitat back into that landscape. And Monsanto's big announcement of dedicating three point six million dollars to monarch conservation. Thanks, Wendy. I wasn't aware of that. When did that happen? Um, yesterday. Oh, okay. <laughs> I need to Yeah, ask. there's there's a couple press releases out about um Monsanto's commitment to monarch conservation and so they're playing a role in this keystone effort. Um and and they've now dedicated money to the NIFWIF fund, to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation fund, um, $3.6 million over the course of three years, I think. And then they've got some other individual contracts with um, other programs, too, that they're funding for specifically for monarch work. So it's an interesting progression. And the other thing I would mention too is you talked a little bit about, Julie talked a little bit about 
um, larva monitoring. And so as the as the monarchs start to arrive in the U.S. from Mexico, you know, starting in Texas, we're really looking for a lot of monitoring observations. And so um, I would put in a plug for the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project and, and for you all to look into that sooner rather than later because we want reports of what monarchs are doing, um, what sort of breeding activity you're seeing in Texas and the southern states right now leading through when they when they leave the area. So that's the only other thing I would add. Thanks, Wendy. That's excellent. So I just have a question. What is the Keystone Initiative? It is um have you heard of the Keystone Initiative um for honeybees? No. I don't have a great understanding of it. Keystone is a, a facilitator, and so they're bringing different um, they're bringing different partners together to talk about monarch conservation. But the, this Keystone effort for monarchs is a lot more agricultural, so it's bringing big ag into the into the monarch conservation um, world, and and trying to identify ways that they can help get milkweed and breeding habitat, migratory habitat back onto the agricultural landscape. Um, you know, we're we're doing some of that as well in, in different ways, but this is a really sort of large scale initiative. Right now it's just, you know, it's it's a it's a big conversation. So they're bringing egg companies and monarch researchers and monarch conservationists all to the same meeting to talk about moving forward. So um, that's really basically what I know about it at this point. So um, I know they have a meeting coming up in a couple weeks, or next week maybe, in Minnesota. Thanks. Julie, this Hi, is Julie. Cool. This is Jennifer in um, in Houston, and I'm sitting here with some partners, and uh, we have a question here. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion in the Houston area about the use of a cultivar milkweed called Mexican milkweed, and it seems like there's been some evolution of thought as to if it's good, bad, or indifferent for the species. I was hoping maybe you could uh, maybe direct our dialogue to how we should advise oh, no. residents or local area usage of that plant. Thanks for that question. Uh, that's come up a lot. And actually, the Monarch Joint Venture has a particular flyer that addresses that specifically. Um, our, our take on that is, you know, Part of our mission is to conserve native biodiversity, and it would be best to look into your regional milkweed species, and there are also documents for that, I think also on Monarch Joint Venture um, on their website, and also the Xerces Society has created um, a great monarch uh, milkweed handbook that indicates um, where, and the USDA websites on their um, their plant uh, their plant uh, what do they call the plant websites also have range maps where you can see where uh, you know your regional milkweed are growing if they're in your county. So I think the approach would be to to um, uh, make your partners aware that there are these resources and it would be more beneficial to plant the natives in their area. Um, and we're hoping the plant material center our centers are working on developing those so that the the seed will be more accessible. Um, and there might be a little bit of a time lag between now and when the seed is available, but let them know that it's it's going to be happening. And in the meantime, if they could plant um, you know a, a more of a generalist native that has a wider distribution, like the the green green milkweed and the antelope milkweed, those are um, strong suggestions for Texas for now. Um, Wendy, do you have anything to add to that? Um, sure. I guess, you know, so the main consideration for our opposition to tropical milkweed in the southern U.S. is that it 
if it's planted there, it can grow, it has the ability to grow year round, and we found that that's increasing the prevalence of disease. And so, you know, we, we have evidence to show that if you have tropical milkweed growing year round, the monarchs are, some monarchs are foregoing the migration to Mexico and breeding on that milkweed throughout the winter where they normally wouldn't be there because the native milkweeds have died back. And because of that, um, the, the OE parasite is building up on those plants that are growing year round and then increasing the, increasing the amount of disease that we're seeing in monarchs breeding in the winter. Um, so, so it has some potential implications for the monarch migration in that way. So, but we also recognize that it is one of the most highly available milkweeds in the south. And so, like Julie mentioned, until that lag of native milkweed availability comes to, we need to recognize that, that milkweed does still need to be on the landscape. So what we're recommending is that if you do have tropical milkweed, that you cut it back um, prior to the fall migration so that monarchs that are moving through don't find that milkweed to reproduce on. And, and then by cutting it back, you're also eliminating um, the parasite spores that may have built up on it. So in the meantime, that's our, our best recommendation is to cut the tropical milkweed back during winter months. And because they have such deep roots, they'll come right back up in the spring. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the most widespread milkweeds in the Houston area and probably throughout the south. So that's, that's kind of what I was looking for. And it doesn't sound like we should be advising people to pull it out of their gardens entirely yet. Right, but definitely cut it back in the winter. Great. So, Wendy, specifically, what would be the best time to cut it back? Like November, or what are you thinking? Or before that? Um, you'll have to probably do it repeatedly. Um, so, I guess, really, you know, to follow the migration front, you'll want to cut it back before the before the fall migrants come through. Um, and then you'll probably have to keep cutting it because it will come right back within a few weeks, probably. So, or you'll start to see a little bit of new growth. So, we really cut it back, you know, once a month, every few weeks at least during the winter so that it, it stays dormant. That's great. That's really helpful. So maybe start in September or late August even? Yeah. Um, I guess I'd have to refer to the Journey North map to get an idea of when, when you're going to see monarchs in the fall. Um, this is Bill Bardish. There was a couple questions that came on the chat, Julie, then uh, people have a uh, little, little clarification in, 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 uh, in terms of what is the, uh, uh, the monarch population situation right now. I, uh, there was, uh, you know, the, the concern for numbers dropping and, and then the numbers picked up somewhat, but there was a significant winter event, I think, this year. And uh, then there was another follow-up question about uh, the NIFWIF funding. So if, if you could maybe elaborate on the, the monarch population situation at this point in time, uh, just briefly. Well, let's see. Again, Wendy might know more, but uh, based on the Journey North information, um, you're right. So, so the only time they can really get an accurate count on the monarchs is when they're all clustered together in their overwintering grounds in Mexico. And that's done at, um, via a proxy of how much acreage they cover. So right, this year, based on that acreage, the numbers went up to 56 and a half million. But after that, there were, what, it was nine days of torrential rain, I think. Um, and I don't know if that's the event you're referring to, Bill. Um, and there were, there were photos of, of quite a few monarchs kind of um, down on the ground. And you know, once they get down on the ground, it's, it's, they often drown. 
especially during rainfall <clears throat> events like that. So, um, but Journey North has indicated that they've begun their, their movements north and it, they look healthy and other conditions are looking good. It was a, a, an abundance of moisture in some areas, but the overall moisture and the cooler temperatures have um, delayed the migration a little bit, but they also help them um, conserve their lipid storage in their bodies so that they might have more success in their movements northward if they can't find nectar sources right away. So it's a combination of factors right now and actual numbers, I don't have any information on that. And Wendy, have you heard any numbers since the the 56 million count? Um, like for the current status of the population? Right. I mean, I guess just the the one, yeah, the 1.13 hectares is is really all that we know at this point. I don't know if any numbers were released. Um, that the population size changed over the course of the winter. I haven't heard anything, at least. Okay. Yeah, um, I but that's why we're, you know, really pushing for larval monitoring is because we have protocols in place that we, we have data for, you know, almost 20 years of, of monarchs using milkweeds in the U.S., um, eggs and larvae. And so if we can really ramp up that effort, and get more wide-scale monitoring of milkweed habitats, we'll have a better way to estimate the status of the population of the breeding population. Um, and that might help inform what the population will look like in Mexico as well. So, so that's one of the things that the joint venture is really pushing for this year is, is ramping up monitoring efforts. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Um, and Bill, I guess in terms of your um, NIFWIF funding, out of the um, Fish and Wildlife Services directors, uh, two million that was off, um, that was spread out to regions. But in addition to that, there was um, a 1.3 million um, grant to NIFWIF for monarch conservation, and that was to be used to um, invite others to add to that pool, and it looks like Monsanto, <laughs> um, I'd heard rumblings that they were considering it, but that's great that they did um, step up and contribute the 3.6 million. What I know about that is that um, they will be, there will be calls for proposals, uh, RFPs, and the moment those come out, um, I'll do my best to spread them as widely as possible. Um, and I don't have any other information as far as you know how large those projects could be in terms of funding. Um, but I think if you have a good idea and want to consider writing a proposal, I, I, you're welcome to contact me and we can work together on that. Or um, you know that is something to keep in the back of our minds if, if we have a good proposal project. Um, I really don't know any more than that, and I, I, I'll get in touch with headquarters, and if I find something, and I'll follow up with that, and I'll get back to you if there's um, any additional information. So in terms of time frames and stuff, I just do not know. I don't think anything's been announced. Okay. I, uh, I think, you know, this has run about 15 minutes longer than normal, but uh, as we've all found out in the last six months, this is a very – very uh, uh, provocative discussion that has, uh, again, uh, captured uh, a large number of people that we normally don't get to. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to at least inform folks uh, of what's happening and, and the, the level of interest out there. Again, we've maintained our, our Gulf Coast Prairie LCC focus as being to promote those functional grassland landscapes uh, with uh, a species like monarch as, as a way to maybe get that message out to a broader community. And uh, we'll continue the discussion. Uh, any any last, uh, last questions for Julie or, or Wendy or others before we go? Julie, any closing remarks from your end? 
Well, I, I want to make sure that Greg Elliott had a chance to express any um, comment or question in the, on the hand raised on my screen. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. I, you, you, you already addressed my questions. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, you're most welcome. Well, I just want to thank you all for um, being interested and on the phone today. I really appreciate your interest. And all of you are welcome to email me with any other questions that might arise. Um, it's just julie underscore McIntyre at fws.gov. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Great, uh, great discussion. And we'll be in touch uh, about next month's webinar uh, shortly. Thank you all. Thank you, Bill. Great job, everybody. Thank you.